2010 by Zibowski, Pietrzak, and Wicks. Uh, and as in any coding scheme, uh, we have an encoder and an decoder, and uh, the property, the minimum property we need is correctness. So the decoding of the encoding of the message S should give back the message S. Informally, non malleability is the following. Uh, any modification, any code word modification uh, uh, is like, uh, will not yield a code word that decodes to uh, a message which is related to the original one. And I will explain later what this means. This, notions, this notion finds, interesting applic finds apl useful application to CCA secure encryption, uh, non malleable commitments, and uh, the most notable application is in tamper resilient cryptography. So here is the idea. Uh, we have an experiment. So we have the message S. Uh, we, have, uh, we encode the message S and we get a code word C. Then the attacker applies the tampering function F and we get a code word C prime and then we decode. So uh, the output of the decoder can be either the message, the original message S, uh, or it can be an invalid uh, string like bottom. So bottom here, uh, denotes an invalid string. So the first two outputs here is like in error correcting codes, right? So in error correcting codes, if you have like a bounded number of errors in a code word, uh, you will receive your original message or you will receive bottom. So in this notion, um, we allow the output of the decoder to be a message S prime, which is unrelated to the original message S. And I will explain what unrelated means uh, in the next slides. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, we have the experiment, so we have the attacker. Uh, in the red box, the attacker is interacting with, uh, with the tampering experiment. So the attacker supplies a function f. Uh, uh, the function f is being applied uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the code word, we get a code word C prime, and then uh, the, uh, the attacker gets the output of, uh, of, the tampering, of the tampered execution. So this is the real world scenario, it's the real world attack. So non malleability means that uh, this attack, for, for this attack here, we have a simulator, this guy here, and the interaction between the attacker uh, and the experiment in the red box can be simulated by the simulator uh, that we have here. Basically, this means uh, that uh, the attacker cannot distinguish if he's uh, like uh, in, the, in the green box or if he is in the red box. But you can see that here we can simulate the tampering attack on the green box without having access to the original message. So here we can simulate the attack by only having access to the tampering function, which basically means that the attacker by tampering does not gain any information, uh, any sensitive information related to our message S, our private message S, which basically means that this attack here is useless, right? So we, we're in a physical world, uh, we are in a world without physical attacks. Uh, so, yeah, so th this is the idea here. It's, it's like basically like someone is tampering with uh, the memory of a laptop uh, inside the room uh, and we don't know the data uh, that uh, the memory contains and we can simulate the tampering effect on the data by only inspecting the tampering function. Uh, so the application of this primitive uh, uh, is the following. Uh, so in standard crypto, we have uh, black box adversaries. So we have a cryptographic device. Here we have a smart card. Uh, the device implements uh, like uh, cryptographic functionality G uh, with private key S. Uh, S here denotes the private key of the device. So in the classical uh, interaction, the standard interaction, the attacker uh, gives input X to the device and receives GS of X. And by the properties of the primitive, by the properties of G, we have security. Now, the real world setting is like that, okay? We have the real world adversary is a tampering adversary uh, that besides having black box access to the device, he can also like modify the private memory, uh, it, it's private memory. So besides only supplying input X, he can also like choose a function of his choice 
And then instead of receiving GS of X, he receives G of X but computed on the modified uh, memory value. So he receives, uh, so the memory value here is F of S. And now, of course, we have, uh, we have uh, huge uh, problems, security problems, and uh, basically the security is like fall, falls apart. Um, and here is how we solve this problem in practice. The solution of this problem is very, very easy. Uh, so how do we protect memory against tampering attacks? So on the left, we have the original circuit. We have the original functionality with private memory S. So the resulting, the secure functionality does the following. Instead of storing directly uh, uh, the, the S value inside the memory, we first encode S using uh, a non-mailable code. Okay, th this is quite easy. So instead of directly storing S, we store the non-mailable encoding of S, which here is S hat. It's denoted by S hat. And in order to compute G, uh, G uh, S of X, what we do, we first need to decode. So we first to de we decode the memory, uh, we receive S, and we perform the computation. And of course, if the code were, uh, if the code were there is like uh, invalid, uh, the output of the decoding uh, algorithm is going to be bottom, and the device erases its private memory, self-destructs. Uh, so by the property, by the non-malleability property here, any attack against the memory, against S hat, can be simulated while having, uh, uh, while, while, uh, without having access to the memory itself, right? So all the properties of the primitive are being preserved also in this setting, right? So we have simulation-based security and everything is okay. Um, so, uh, as in the case of error correcting codes, we cannot have like, we cannot tolerate uh, any function class. Uh, so, we cannot achieve non mailability against any function class. So, for instance, here is an, uh, here's an example basically, a very, a very easy example that uh, justifies this idea. Uh, assume that the tampering function receives the code word, uh, first decodes, and then outputs the encoding of S plus one. Okay, this is very, very easy attack. Uh, now what's the problem here? The problem here is that C prime encodes a message which is highly related to the original one. Like it's, it's the property, we, we, it's, it's the opposite of the, the, prop, the non-malleability property. So this, this, uh, this attack is not simulatable because uh, uh, because the final code word depends on, on the original message, right? Uh, there are many, many interesting uh, models uh, that have been considered so far. So in this work, we consider the split state model, uh, which was also uh, uh, considered in DPW and uh, the Liu Yasuka paper 2012. Uh, so in this model, we assume that memory uh, uh, like is physically separated in, in two parts. So we have two memories that are physically separated. And we encode any message S, the encoder of any message for any message S, it, it just produces a pair. Produces a pair C, C1 and C2. And we store those two uh, strings separately in those two physically separated memories. Uh, and the, the assumption here is that uh, its function tampers with uh, the memory contents independently of the contents of the other memory. So F1 tampers with C1, but this, uh, uh, this tampering is independent of C2. Basically, it's like having, um, you, can, you, can, uh, you can think that like the two functions are like two people, and you have two people and two rooms. So those two people can decide their strategy before entering the two rooms, right? It's their tampering strategy. But when they enter the rooms, they, they cannot communicate what they see inside the rooms. So in this way, we exploit the lack of information of F1 uh, with respect to C2 in order to achieve security and uh, the symmetric thing. So, uh, this, uh, so this primitive gives us like a very, very uh, easy 
uh, elegant and simple solution uh, for, a, for a real, for a practical problem. Uh, we, ideally, we would like to, to, uh, to have non-malleable codes in our uh, mobile phones or, uh, I don't know, uh, everywhere. Uh, still, uh, the, f the final size of the circuit may be a problem. So we need to avoid some like scenarios like that. So we don't want to be like our cell phone is like that. The size of the cell phone is like that. So uh, the, the applicability and usefulness of the primitive depends entirely on the efficiency of the underlying, uh, of the underlying uh, primitive. So in this work, uh, we construct practically efficient uh, computationally secure non malleable codes in the split state model, in the model I just presented. Uh, and basically, our construction is based on, uh, on a primitive that we define uh, and construct, which is called, called Elmore Extractable Hash, uh, which we believe it is a primitive uh, of uh, independent interest. So I know this table is like, uh, difficult to parse, but uh, so this is a comparison table uh, that shows uh, the efficiency uh, of previous works and, uh, and ours, which is in the bottom. So the, first two, so the first column is like the scheme. The second is the code word length with respect to the, uh, to the length of the message and the security parameter. Then we have the model, if we, it is computational or information theoretic. And finally, we have the, the underlying assumption that is being used. Uh, so the first two works are information theoretic. Uh, uh, the second one, by Agraval et al, is start, and the start here means that uh, asymptotically they're optimal, but uh, there are some hidden constants uh, that, as the author suggests, uh, like they're astronomical, uh, they're very, very big. Um, and then uh, uh, the work which is closer to ours is like the, uh, the LL12 paper by Leon Lysijanska, yeah, which, like, this is the best effort thing to present this work. So if we combine the LL12 paper with uh, uh, the state of the art uh, on the area with the Agra Valetal compiler uh, and uh, uh, Naor Segev public key encryption, leakage resilient public key encryption, and the growth Sahai proofs, uh, we get the length that you see there. Uh, the construction uses leakage resilient public key encryption and uh, robust non-interactive zero knowledge proofs. So what we do is that we kill uh, uh, public key encryption and we substitute it with authenticated symmetric encryption and we kill the NISC proof, the non-interactive zero knowledge proof, and we substitute it with our extractable hash. Uh, so we achieve like optimal code word length uh, using of course the knowledge of exponent assumption, uh, which, is, uh, which is a strong assumption. Uh, so the number of operations in our encoding, uh, decoding uh, procedures is like 128 group operations independently of the message length plus the cost of one-time leakage resilient authenticated encryption which can be very, very efficient. So the logic behind our result is the following. We, for, we first construct a non malleable code for affine functions, for functions of the form A times X plus B with some extra, sorry, some extra property that I, I will not uh, uh, say anything about it. Uh, then uh, we construct, uh, using the non malleable code for a fine function, uh, we construct the primitive that we call Elmore extractable hash. And basically for those who know the uh, Agraval et al work, this can be considered uh, as the computational analog of non malleable reductions, uh, of a non malleable reduction. And finally, we, use the Elmore extractable hash to build a non malleable code for the split state model. So some, some general things about extractable hash. So the idea is that a, a hash function family is extractable if sampling an element from the range of the hash uh, is hard without actually computing the function on a pre-image that we know. So we have an attacker here the attacker outputs a valid hash value V. Valid hash valid value means that outputs a, 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 a value which is, belongs to the range of the hash. Uh, so assuming the hash is extractable, then the attacker must know a valid preimage for V. Otherwise, he cannot output a valid uh, hash value V. 
So uh, using this attacker, we have an extractor. The extractor is having access to the code uh, of the attacker, and he's able to extract a valid pre-match for V. This is the idea of extractability, uh, of extractable hash in general. Uh, so in this work, uh, we, we construct Elmore extractable hash, and the idea is the following. Uh, basically, I think it's clear. Prior to creating his own hash value V, the attacker is given access to L, uh, uh, to L hash values V1, uh, L dot VL, okay? Um, before, we had only zero more. So before, we had extractability, but uh, the attacker uh, didn't have access to any previously computed hash value. And someone might say here, okay, so what, what's the problem, right? What's the difficulty here? I mean, uh, we can assume, we can still assume extractability even if we are here off, or if we are here, it's like the same thing. And uh, uh, the idea is here that this assumption is wrong, right? We cannot do something like that uh, because uh, the attacker might gain some advantage when he's given uh, uh, pre-computed hash values. And what's the idea here? The attacker might be able to combine those hash values somehow. He might like combine V1 with V2, and he might construct some V such that he doesn't know the pre for V. Like if the hash is malleable, right? As in the signatures, right? If you have malleability in signatures, like you have two signatures and you, you, you have a, a forgery. So it's like a forgery here. You combine two hash values and you create a new one for which you do not know uh, the witness, uh, which is the pre -match. Uh, so before, we had zero more extractable hash from the Bitansky, Canetti, Cheza, and Tromer paper, 2012. Uh, basically, this is the hash function. I don't want to get uh, into the details here. So basically, the, to hash a message S, uh, you compute G to the inner product R, S, uh, and uh, G to the A inner product R, S, where, where A is random, and uh, R is a random vector. So this is zero more extractable hash. And why this is zero more extractable, meaning this is extractable in the case where the attacker does not have access to any pre-computed hash values, okay? This comes di directly from the knowledge of exponent assumption, basically, which is a, a generalization of the knowledge of exponent assumption, which was like an assumption uh, which was introduced by Damgard in 92. And basically the idea, if you want to like uh, take the intuition here, is like if you look at the output of the hash here, it's like uh, two group elements. Those two group elements have a specific structure. It's g to the uh, something, g to the a something. So there is a structure here. So any attacker like the assumption says that any attacker who is able to output such a pair, he he should definitely, he, he must definitely compute the function over the message S. Otherwise, it's hard to, to hit this structure. This is basically the, the, the assumption, the knowledge of exponent assumption. Um, so the question here is the following. Um, is the BCCT12 paper like one more extractable? If the attacker receives a, a hash value V, uh, can, like, uh, can we assume the existence of an, ex of an extractor that outputs a valid pre match for the new hash? And basically the answer is no. We prove that BCCT12 is not one more extractable, otherwise we, we break the log. And the idea here is the following. Assume the attacker receives like this hash value V for a message S, and then computes v to the x for some non-zero x, this is v prime, and outputs v prime. Then, if you look on the description of the hash function here, v prime is a valid hash value that has as a preimage x times s, which means that, uh, that the hash is highly malleable. Given a hash, you can construct a v prime hash without actually knowing the preimage. Assuming an extractor for this hash function family, you can invert everything and break the log. You can learn x times s, and then you can extract s. The interesting point here is like, in this attack, 
the attacker applies an affine transformation on the message S. Here is the message S. So by raising to the X, it's like you, have, you apply an affine transformation to the message S. And we prove that under the knowledge of exponent assumption, uh, the, the only thing the attacker can do is to apply an affine transformation on the original message. So, how is, uh, uh, so this is, our con this is our construction, and basically our construction is a composition between the zero more extractable hash of BCCT12 and uh, the, the encoding scheme which is secure against uh, affine functions that we have already constructed. I didn't say anything about it, but trust me that we have such a scheme with, with some extra property uh, again. So our hash function, uh, before, like, uh, um, uh, in order to hash a message S, we first encode this using non-malleable code. No, I have more time, I have my clue. Uh, for, uh, like, uh, affine uh, functions. And then we hash using the zero more extractable hash. And basically the idea is that we reduce uh, uh, the attack against the hash here we have V to an affine attack against, against the encoding that lives in the exponent. And we use the simulator of the non malleable code to extract a valid pre match for the hash. So interestingly, BCT12 is not one more extractable, but we prove L more extractability under the same assumptions. Uh, so here's our, uh, our code, basically. Uh, no, basically, this is not our code. Uh, this is a simple construction that uh, uh, we can, basically we can construct our code together. Uh, so let's say our, encode is, uh, our encoding scheme uh, first encrypts the message S under secret key SK and puts the ciphertext uh, on the right uh, and puts uh, the secret key on the left. Uh, we, use, we use authenticated encryption, which means that if the attacker modifies the ciphertext, uh, uh, he will break like the code word. This, this is what authenticated encryption means. So we reduce our, uh, the security of this primitive uh, to, the, uh, to the semantic security of the encryption. But we have some issues. The authenticity property of the encryption scheme uh, goes away if the attacker modifies the, si the secret key. So if the attacker modifies the left part of the memory, we know nothing. Moreover, uh, when the simulator tries to simulate this attack, he doesn't have access to the secret key. So in the proof, uh, we reduce the security of this primitive to the semantic security of the encryption. So the attacker plays against the semantic security experiment. So from now on, uh, like I want you to remember that we don't have, like we don't have access to the secret key. The simulator does not have access to the secret key, but knows the ciphertext. So this is idea number one. Uh, the next idea is the previous one plus extractable hash. So uh, it's basically the same construction, but we also hash the secret key. Why we do that? Because we won't like to have extractability. Uh, uh, we, like when, when, uh, when uh, the attacker uh, produces V prime, we need like to use V prime and extract a valid pre uh, for uh, for V prime. Uh, which is, uh, which is going to help for decoding. So now we can extract, okay, uh, this is right. No, this is not right, basically, because we are using extractable hash, or in our terminology, zero more extractable hash, uh, which is like, um, uh, which, for instance, if you instantiate this thing with the BCC12 construction, uh, this is highly malleable, so you cannot assume extractability. So this is where we use uh, the one more extractable hash. Uh, this is where we use uh, our tool. And basically this is the construction. The only difference with the previous one is that our hash is randomized, so uh, we need to store the randomness of the hash on the left part of the memory together with the secret key. And we reduce uh, the security to the properties of our, uh, of our primitives. Of course, we still have some issues. As I told you before, we don't know the secret key. Uh, when we try to prove security, we don't have access to the secret key. So someone might say, how does the simulator compute V over here? 
And let's say we have V some way. We have V, V is like the simulator, sorry for doing that. V, I, simulator is the same thing. Uh, so uh, the simulator has, the ciphertext has V, computes F2 and receives E prime V prime. Then he can extract a valid pre-match for V prime. But then we need to check consistency with the right, with the left part of the memory. So we use, we do all those things using leakage over the secret key. We compute uh, the hash uh, using leakage uh, over the secret key and we check consistency with the left part of the memory again using leakage uh, over the secret key. If the attacker does not, does not modify the hash, we use the collision resistance property of, uh, collision resistance property of, of uh, our hash. This is the construction. Again, uh, authenticated encryption binds together the ciphertext together with the secret key. If you don't modify the secret key and you modify the ciphertext, then you break everything. If you modify the secret key, we have the one more extractable hash of the secret key, and then we can use it to extract a valid uh, secret key for the new hash V prime. This is uh, the LL12 uh, construction. It uses public key encryption. Uh, and uh, so we kill, uh, the, the, we kill the encryption, the public key encryption, we use symmetric encryption, and the, the proof here is uh, non-interactive zero-knowledge proof, so we kill the proof over there, and we have the, the Elmore extractable hash. This is how we do it. And yeah, this is what we construct, uh, practical efficient codes from Elmore extractable hash. Some interesting directions is like applying our techniques for improving other primitives. Uh, construct unbelievable codes for other interesting classes of uh, tampering functions. So now we, we explore the case of continual unbelievable codes. And uh, finally, uh, kill the knowledge of exponent assumption. This is what we can like improve. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you.